Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining a session and taking some time out your Friday evening. So this is going to be a talk on IV fluids and electrolytes by Dr. Dea. And so this is a topic that a lot of F1s are scared about, worried about. So hopefully, you know, we'll feel a lot more comfortable at the end of this talk. Um, these sessions, again, very informal, very chill. So, you know, any questions, comments, feel free to either put them in the Zoom chat, put them in the Facebook chat. And yeah, no judgment and pass off to Dea. Hi guys, um, some of you might know me, yep, so I'm currently in F2, coming up to the end of it, which is kind of scary. I've been working on RESP now for over six months. Uh, so IV fluids and electrolytes is kind of bread and butter for your F1 uh, days and definitely on calls as well. It's probably the thing you will be asked to uh, do, like as in prescribe or sort out the most. Um, Yep, so obviously this is being live streamed, you guys already know that. Um, all right, so uh, in terms of the learning objectives, I can't tell you like absolutely everything there is to do with fluids, but I thought we'd recap some of the basics of fluids and to know the uh, some of the indications of IV fluids, um, sort of what factors to consider when prescribing fluids and be aware of the management of some common electrolyte abnormalities that you might come across in your on-calls. So yeah, like I said, it will literally be the bane of your F1 life. And the answer is not always one liter of normal saline over 10 hours. Like literally that is, there is a lot more to actually consider. Um, always ask if you're, if it's for a patient who you don't know, because when you're on ward cover on calls, you know, you're, you're not gonna know most of the patients. So um, in Kettering, it's still quite backward. It's manual prescribing. So it, it's a case of physically going to the ward uh, with uh, electronic prescribing, which is the case in many of the trusts, so in my F1 year I worked in Leicester, so in Leicester Royal Infirmary in Glenfield it's electronic prescribing, so uh, you can check those things obviously online, um, either by ward or by patient details, so that does make it a little bit easier, but even then sometimes you end up having to go to the patient because if you you just ask, you know, why is this patient on IV fluids and why do you think they need more, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different reasons people go on it. And then you need to consider, you know, the weight of the patient. So frail elderly patients are going to have different fluid needs to like a 20 something year old who works out at the gym three times a week, um, even more maybe. Um, indication and also what the electrolyte status is, how fast you're going to give it, et cetera. So there's not a one size fits all policy, basically. So um, I I don't know how this is going to work, but if some people just shout out, there are there are so many indications of IV fluids. I'm just going to list a few. But if between you guys, you want to come up with maybe five indications of IV fluids, uh, you can put them in the chat and I can read them out. I mean, whichever way works, really. Hypovolemic shock. Hypervolemia, yeah, good. Dehydration, yep. Yeah. Anything else? Hyperthalassemia, very good. Yes, yep, yeah, surgery, good. IV meds, yep, yeah, okay. Hyponatremia, yeah, that, I mean, that's a talk in itself, according to Amir Sam, I mean. Okay, yeah, I think we've got some good ones. So, um, right, uh, let me just, um, okay. So this is, like I said, not an exhaustive list. Um, so sepsis, AKI, nil by mass, so somebody put surgery. So I think um, uh, surgery uh, means that often uh, in the perioperative period, they're nil by mass, so they're gonna need IV fluids. Um, diarrhea and vomit, so gastrointestinal GI losses, Top up hydration, so this is very common in Jerry. So if they're eating and drinking variably or not very well, uh, you might just want to top up their uh, fluid intake. If you're on a uh, variable rate insulin and then electrolyte replacement. Um, IV antibiotics is, I, I suppose that is an IV fluid obviously, but um, I haven't put that, but um, of course that is also um, IV fluids. The other electrolytes that you might need to replace are things like bicarbonate as well, which I've not put here, um, but um, yeah, so like I said, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are like common indications of IV fluids. Okay, so we're just going to go through some basics. Apologies if this is sort of hammering in things that you guys already know. It's just kind of a little bit back to physiology, but it helps to put things into context. So 
you've got your total body fluid, also known as total body water, and then you've got the intracellular components and extracellular. So the intracellular bit is majority, so it's two thirds, and uh, it's, uh, it's the easy part because it's all inside the uh, plasma uh, membrane, so inside the cell, literally. Extracellular has three subdivisions. So interstitium is the small narrow spaces in between tissues or parts of an organ. And it's when fluid accumulates there that we call it interstitial edema. And this contributes to so interstitial fluid as part of extracellular. So in total body fluid, it's about 15%. So of an average like um, human, which is t uh, said to be a 70 kilo male, it's about 10.5 liters. Uh, thereabouts. Um, and so the interstitial fluid is important because that's what will allow uh, movement of substances across the cell membrane or barrier. Um, so intravascular, no surprises that the main intravascular component is going to be blood and average volume of blood, this is about 70 mils per kilo. Um, and then third spacing, you'll hear this term thrown around by emergency physicians, ITU people a lot. Um, so it's where fluids that um, uh, oh God, that's a terrible grammar, but where fluids aren't supposed to be found in large amounts. So um, peritoneal cavity, pleural spaces are some of them. Obviously, um, you guys will clock onto the fact that um, pleural um, fluid was obviously there because you need a little bit of lubrication between the visceral and the parietal pleura. So the um, third spacing is where it's not supposed to be there in large quantities. Um, and this is seen with... Um, sort of very unwell patients, it's described as a phenomenon called third spacing, where you're giving them fluid, but they're just, it's not actually replacing the volume. Okay, and then obviously within fluid, we have solute, so things that are dissolved within the fluid. So these can be further broken down into your plasma proteins, um, obviously albumin. So when albumin goes down, we start to think of malnutrition and also uh, liver function, because the liver makes albumin. Um, Fibrinogen is another important one in clotting, as I'm sure you guys are all aware. So low fibrinogen, you think DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which is a consumptive coagulopathy associated with uh, very, uh, some infections, such as meningococcal, sep meningococcal septicemia, or uh, also hematological malignancies, such as lymphoma. So uh, we had a patient admitted to our ward with shortness of breath. She had a pleural effusion and uh, which was drained and she was also found to be in DIC with very high APCC, like deranged clotting and low fibrinogen, which is the clincher to say that it's DIC. And um, we had to give her cryoprecipitate, which is um, usually given when the fibrinogen is low. Um, and she later turned out to have lymphoma. So um, that was the cause of the DIC. Um, so, um, in terms of ions, uh, obviously uh, sodium chloride, um, magnesium, calcium carbonate, bicarbonate, these are all things that I'm sure you guys already know. Glucose amino acids are sort of the food molecules, and then you also have things like urea, which can build up in either dehydration, kidney failure, or um, also upper GI bleed, although the mechanism there is obviously different. So total body fluids are affected by um, so person factors, if you think about it that way. So the overweight or obese person um, will have a less total body fluid compared to people because they have more fat than muscle. Um, children tend to have more and um, a full term neonate or at term neonate can have up to even 80% of, uh, of them being um, their fluid. Elderly because of loss of muscle mass have a lower amount of total body fluid, which is why um, we also, we often have to replace fluid, but we often give it at a slower pace. And women also, they have a higher uh, proportion of body fat. So um, they have less um, total body fluid compared to men. So um, this is the first question. So which of the following would affect uh, like the amount of total body fluid that you have. So if people want to put it in the chat. Um, I'll wait for a couple more responses, but... Yeah, okay, I'm not going to dwell on this. So um, it seems all of you are aware that uh, indeed all of them yeah, so sweating, obviously, you've got excess loss 
polyuria excess loss, diarrhea and vomiting excess loss, burns, a lot of excess loss of fluid. So with all of these things would be, well, sweating in itself won't be an indication, but sweating because they're having, you know, um, a high fever and leading to possible right, early signs of sepsis. So you, you could use that as a reason to need to give um, uh, increased total body fluids. Polyuria obviously could be due to UTI, so treat the underlying cause. Diarrhea and vomiting, typically with viral gastroenteritis, you would be um, giving fluids, um, so encouraging orally, but obviously if they're vomiting a lot, you would need to replace it intravenously. And uh, even with a lot of bacterial gastroenteritis or gastroenteritides, you um, would be giving it um, you wouldn't need to give things like antibiotics until you've exhausted sort of oral um, rehydration or IV rehydration. Okay, oh, uh, so this is just normal fluid balance. So um, obviously the recommended ingested sort of amount of water is obviously less um, above 500 mils, but that's kind of the minimum amount that we'd be drinking in a day. Um, I think the picture is actually quite a nice way. I think um, I forgot to do the animation here. So um, it's just um, to look at the sort of fluid balance. So how fluid is coming into our body and how it's coming out. So, um, and there are a number of losses, obviously through urine, through feces, um, from uh, through the skin and through the respiratory tract throughout the day. So um, on average, we're looking at 30 to 35 mils per kilo per day for an adult. So 2.4, 2.5 liters a day is kind of the fluid balance. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of the term osmolality. So concentration of solution expressed in the total number of solute particles per kilogram. So usually this is expressed as milliosmoles per kilo. Um, so there are things such as serum osmolality and urine osmolality. These things become very important in, um, as I'm sure in the SM would have drilled into you like he did to us, in um, uh, hyponatremia. So when you're assessing volume status, so when you want to see what the cause of the low sodium is, you want to assess volume status. Is it hypovolemic hyponatremia? Is it uvolemic hyponatremia or is it hypervolemic hyponatremia? So tests that we usually do to investigate hyponatremia would include paired serum and urine osmolality. So you would expect the serum osmolality to be low and the urine osmolality to be high. But then you need to look at the urine sodium and that's going to help you determine what type of hyponatremia. That is a different talk in itself, so I'm, I'm not going to go there. Uh, so the next question is, what is the normal serum osmolality range in humans usually? Uh, again, feel free to put it, pop it into the chat. Yeah, we've got an answer from Alex Wright and S. Yeah. Any more for any more? Okay. Okay, so this one, it's it's a little bit of, um, this is a bit of by rote things, but um, it, it's split the vote, but the correct answer is D. So 275 to 295. So this is a calculation that's done. I've not put it in here, but you can look it up. It's a calculation that's done with um, the amount of sodium and potassium and then glucose and also the blood urea nitrogen level. And then depending on the units that the lab uses, you do different conversions. But in a normal person, that equates to a range between 275 to 295. So the first three answers are uh, slightly hypoosmolar and then E is a hyperosmolar um, like figure. Okay, so again, sorry if this is a lot of reiteration and a lot of boring kind of physiology stuff, but I'm sure you guys know this. There are different types of fluid. So you've got colloids and crystalloids. Colloids, um, uh, so they they're large molecules. So um, they often like you need you need big cannulas for for colloids really, and um. So they stay in the intravascular compartment and act as kind of like an intravascular expander. So it tries to increase the blood volume and it draws fluid from the extravascular spaces. Um, 
with crystalloids, they're small molecules, so like um, sodium chloride, uh, dextrose, and these things. So these are small ones that can easily diffuse across the cell membrane. And um, this will uh, increase volume not only in the intravascular spaces like colloids, but also in the interstitial spaces, the small and narrow spaces between tissues. And then crystalloids we think of as hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. So um, the tonic is in relation to the concentration of solutes in normal plasma. So um, different crystalloids will have different compositions. Um, so even within isotonic, you have different fluids, which we'll come on to in a second and they have different concentrations of solute. So hypotonic will be solutes that are a lower concentration than plasma um, solutes, and then hypertonic is the opposite, so they're higher. And isotonic is same, so all Greek words. Okay, so the only other type of blood uh, uh, fluid to mention, of course, is blood products, and you've got a lot of these. Um, so packed red blood cells, most common, so given for blood transfusion. When you say blood transfusion, we usually mean packed red blood cells. Um, and um, so there are obviously indications of that with it. So I'm not going to go into detail on blood transfusion and transfusion reactions because that's kind of a topic in itself. So, um, uh, and then you can also need to, you may need to replace specific clotting factors. You might need to give chiroprecipitate, which we've touched on um, with um, uh, DIC, so low fibrinogen. And you may also, there are some indications of fresh frozen plasma, but we're not going to delve into that in this talk. Um, there are a number of different colloids. They're not used a lot. So gel effusin used to be used a lot more, but then with things like Hartman's and things coming in, in the crystalloids, that gel effusin is very rarely used now. So human albumin solution is still the most um, used colloid. Um, there are some contraindications. Um, and so you're not going to be giving human albumin solution without guidance from a senior anyway. So they tend to be like one to 5% human albumin solution. There are higher concentrations as well. Um, these are just some of the cautions with it, but um, you would give them so, so often with the chronic liver disease patients. So alcoholic liver cirrhosis or liver cirrhosis due to uh, hepatitis C, so loads of different things. Um, we often have to um, give them albumin because um, that is one of the things that can uh, prevent progression of things like hepatorenal syndrome. So, and I mean, you can imagine with a chronic liver patient, um, you're going to have low albumin because the liver is not making enough albumin. So you need to often replace it. So in a liver patient with low BP, sometimes just pumping um, crystalloids or pumping like you know normal saline or even Hartman's which is considered the most physiological um, is not um, going to be enough if you just bear with me one sec why is anemia a contraindication for albumin I'll be very honest um, with I, I don't know I can't remember the exact physiology of that please ask one of your gastro people or I can I can find out I just know when I've prescribed it in the past, I've not been able to, if their hemoglobin is like below 70 or below 60, um, I can get back to you on that. Um, possibly due to, because there's not enough fluid for it to, uh, for it to go into, or there's not enough blood in the first place. Um, like I said, if you leave that question with me, I can get back to you and I can write a reply to SN or one of the other becoming a doctor team and they can circulate that maybe. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, moving on to crystalloids. This isn't an exhaustive list of all the IV fluids that there are, but um, hypotonic, isotonic and hypertonic. So um, we are mainly going to be looking at the isotonic um, group um, but there there will be some um, indications for hyper and hypotonic but the vast majority will be of the time you'll be prescribing isotonic crystalloids so this is just a comparison of the um, normal plasma compared to the different um, to the different substances so you can see why I said Hartman's is the closest to normal plasma um, there are portions to be taken with Hartman's, but um, uh, normal saline is the most readily available, but um, sometimes Hartman's is, um, I prefer giving Hartman's sometimes instead of um, normal saline all the time. So it's a good one to consider. 
Okay, so you need to look at the situation as to why you're giving IV fluids. Are you giving it to an acutely unwell patient who needs fluid resuscitation, or are you giving it to a patient who needs fluid maintenance? So uh, in resuscitation, you want to be thinking of bolus, so they're stat volumes that are given um, sort of over 15 minutes. We, uh, so usually it'll be 500 mils, but if, it's, um, if they're quite frail or they have heart failure with a uh, compromise of um, ejection fraction, you might want to give um, 250 mils instead. And then maintenance, so things like, for example, if they're nilled by mouth um, in the perioperative period, or if they're, um, if they're nilled by mouth in the perioperative period, or they, um, are, um, they just need some top-up hydration if they're not eating and drinking well, very common on the geriatrics ward, then um, you would want to give a slightly um, smaller bolus. And you can always give, so a lot of people are bolus responsive and that kind of thing. So if they have heart failure, you can give them 250 mils and then see what the um, response to that is. And so that's what's called as bolus responsive. And in those kinds of patients, we uh, tend to, with the help of um, services like either IT directly or critical care outreach, who are very, very helpful, you, you can um, give boluses um, to try and maintain a mean arterial pressure. Um, so typically in these patients, I'll try to aim for a mean arterial pressure of 65. It's, it's come through experience rather than there being like a direct formula for it. Okay, so I thought the most helpful will probably be to talk through some practical cases. So um, these are by no means all the cases that you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of reasons why you have to give fluids and electrolytes. So these are just a handful of things that I think are common and important to touch on. So in the first case, you've got Alan, a 27-year-old man, brought to A&E, who's becoming unwell over the last few days, and he's come in today because of increasing shortness of breath and fever. I'm not going to ask you for the diagnosis of COVID, which it might well be, but we want to have a look at the observations. So uh, temperature high, respirate high, SATs low, heart rate high, BP low. Um, so just in terms of normal ranges, so for temperature, obviously we're looking at some uh, figures between 36 and uh, 38, but from 37.5, you start thinking hmm, low-grade fever. They probably won't start scoring until they have a temperature of 38 or 38.1 on the early warning or the national early warning score. Respiratory rate, normal range for um, adults is 12 to 20. So... Um, above uh, between 20 to i think 25 scores a two on the early warning score and then uh 26 and above is a three so uh and then saturations um so up to 96 percent is uh it doesn't score anything and then 95 and 94 percent score one 93 to 91 percent score two and then um uh, 90% and below will score three. Obviously, if they're then on a scale two because they're a chronic retainer of CO2, for example, in um, chronic COPDs, then obviously 88 to 92 in the SATs um, score on early warning score is done accordingly. Heart rate, um, so uh, 60 to 90 is the normal range. 92, I think 105 or 110 scores of one, 110 to 120 scores of two, and 120 and above scores of three. Blood pressure, so we're looking at the systolic uh, usually for this. So um, up to 110, so down to 110, it scores zero. 110 down to 100 scores um, two. 91 to 100 scores, um, sorry, 91 to 100 scores two. 101 to 110 scores one. And then below 90, such as in this case, it would score three. Uh, so this person's early warning score, I think, will be so temperature that we score two and three five and two seven and two nine and three. So they're scoring a twelve. So that this is quite an unwell patient. What is the most appropriate fluid therapy for this side for our twenty-seven-year-old um, Alan?
Okay, so again, this is split the vote a little bit between um, uh, D and E. Correct answer for this gentleman, this 27 year old gentleman is D. So uh, I think you can use either Hartman's or normal saline, it doesn't really matter. The point that I was trying to get at was the volume that you give. So this guy's 27. I don't think I mentioned any comorbidities. So in a healthy person with no comorbidities, you would give 500 mils with that blood pressure and see if they respond well to it. And you can actually bolus this person twice because someone who's gone into, um, with tachycardia, hypotension, tachypnea, so what kind of condition am I getting at here? So what, what's this physiological state known as? Again, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this person is in shock and probably to spare the qualifier, they're in septic shock, exactly. So, so part of sepsis six, I should have probably put that as a slide uh, before I send it out, I'll add it in as a slide. So you might be aware that sepsis six, so give three, take three. So I always think of take three first because you need to do those things before. In terms of take three, you want to take blood cultures before you give antibiotics. You want to take the urine output. No, got another question. Um, so Hartman's contains a small amount of lactate, but you, um, so I haven't put that this patient is necessarily got a high lactate. Um, in recess situations, the amount of lactate that we are giving is is deemed physiologically insignificant. So I think here the main point I was getting at more than the type of fluid that you give for the bolus is the volume of fluid you want to give for the bolus. Um, it, the, every trust will have often like a policy for sepsis six, so they will say 0.9% or Hartman. So I've, I've done it with both and usually the amount of lactate in Hartman's isn't used as a contraindication to not give it in, um, in sepsis, but I appreciate your point. Okay, so, um, or, where was I, sepsis six. So um, give three, take three. Um, so we'd said we want to take cultures, we want to take the urine output, so we have to catheterize them usually, and then we want to take the lactate. So that is what you would do. And in terms of giving, you would want to give oxygen, so this patient would need that because if you remember their um, oh, saturations were low as well. So, so give oxygen, give fluids, which is obviously what this talk is about, and you would also give antibiotics, especially with that. So in most uh, trusts, you would give a stat dose of maripenem, and then you'd want to put them on a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic. So you check allergies, and you'd usually put them on something like tazacin. If they're um, allergic to uh, penicillin, then you would um, continue to give maripenem. Okay. So as you guys correctly identified, this is shock. So there isn't enough blood flow to the tissues because of circulatory issue, and this results in hemodynamic compromise. So we're talking about um, tachycardia and hypotension. What about vasopressor? We are coming on to vasopressor, so it'll depend on the type of shock. So um, different. Uh, so there are different types of shock, and then there's different classifications of shock. So we'll just go a little bit through that. Okay, so this is the classification. So these are the grades of shock. Um, um, I I can maybe maybe not right now because I I just want to go through the common things. I'm not I'm not going to go extensively into um, AKI with heart failure because that is that, it's not a talk in itself, but it's a big topic. I will touch on that in a little while. Let me just talk through this first. So, so, um, okay, right. So if, um, if many of you are tennis fans, so the classes of shock can be thought of in terms of the tennis points. So you have 15, 30, 14 game usually. So up to 15% is, uh, counted as class one up to, um, um, up to um, 
30%, so 15 to 30 is class two, 30 to 40 class three and above 40 class four. A lot of people think that you have to have low BP in order to be in shock. No, if you have low BP, it means you're in grade three shock already. Um, so um, the you tend to already have um, tachycardia and actually often also um, tachypnea in sort of the early stages. And then you start to lose your urine output from class two and then your BP goes down in class three with a higher tachycardia to try and um, compensate. So uh, this is just, I find it a helpful table to consider the classes of shock. And then, uh, apologies for the image quality here, but these are the different types of shock. So hypovolemia, cardiogenic, distributive, and um, obstructive. So uh, this is a kind of distributive shock, um, which is distributed can often be similar to hypovolemic, but um, this is looking more at a distributive or septic shock. So the cardiac output is increased, but the systemic vascular resistance goes down. So um, if we go on to the next slide, so I think this is a really nice slide which looks at the different treatments depending on, um, so this is where the terminology gets confusing because you don't need to give vasoconstrictors or vasopressors to everyone in septic shock. Actually, it's sepsis-driven hypovolemia that you're treating, so you need to give crystalloids. So they say two liter bolus. And then only after that, if crystalloids aren't working, then you would consider vasoconstrictors um, or vasopressors to increase the, uh, to, uh, the peripheral vascular resistance qualities. So, um, so these patients, so Alan is a young 27 year old, and if he is severely in septic shock, that um, you would probably be calling critical care and seeing if they want to take over because um, they, with no past medical history, they would be for full escalation. So this is where, this is why you would need a senior review to make sure that they have, um, that they have a correct escalation plan and they're being managed in the correct place. So after initial resuscitation in A&E, this is the kind of patient that might end up going to um, ITU. So you're treating the hypovolemia first and then you can move on to vasopressors. So um, distributive shock in other things, so for example, in anaphylaxis, you would want to give things like, obviously we give adrenaline in um, anaphylaxis. Um, okay. Um, right, so this is a good thing to look at in your own time as well. But um, in terms of, I wouldn't get too bogged down in the terminology between uh, and the difference between um, in septic drop distributive or hypovolemic, but the truth is it's a bit of both. So you treat the sepsis driven hypovolemia, and then if it's not improving, then you move on to vasopressors. So I think someone asked about vasopressors before. So. Okay, this is the next case. So Betty is a 65 year old lady, has hypertension and stage two bladder cancer. She's gonna have a cystectomy and uh, she needs to be kneeled by mouth from midnight before the operation tomorrow. So what would you give Betty in terms of fluids. Okay, so we've had a few responses. Any more? OK, 
Okay. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on. So it is actually B. So um, remember, Betty's going to be nil by mouth. So she's not going to be able to eat anything as well as not be able to drink anything. So that's why we need to vary the um, type of fluid that we're giving. So we want to give, so you guys may have come across this when you did your PSA. So aim for one salty and two sweet for those with um, who are nil by mouth because they're not eating anything. So in the perioperative period, this is quite common. When Sometimes you end up giving two salty and one sweet, that's okay, but it, it should never be three lots of normal saline because you need to give them dextrose, you need to give them some calories from somewhere. Um, the perioperative management with other things like NG feeds and things is something that you'll experience when you're on your surgery job. I'm not focusing on when to give NG feeds, when to give TPN, that is, that is almost nutrition is a talk in itself. But from the fluid point of view, that's why we tend to give one salty and two sweet, because with the two sweet, with the dextrose, you can still give saline, so that's not a problem. Um, so this tends to typically be, so uh, uh, this would be eight hourly bags of juice. So say, for example, a young person is having, a young guy is having an elective orchidectomy, um, and they need to be nil by mouth then they would be on eight hourly bags usually. And then for the elderly with a lot of comorbidities, you'd consider slower bags, so 10 or even 12 hourly bags. Um, but um, usually in the perioperative period, eight hourly, and then if they're elderly, 10 hourly. So you, want, you always want to see, is the patient eating or drinking? So that's especially important on geriatric, for geriatric patients, you want to make sure that they're, um, because that will determine what kind of fluid you're giving. If they're eating, but you know they're still clinically dry. Then you want to, um, if they're still clinically dry, you you want to maybe only give them normal saline. Um, whereas if they're not eating either, you need to give them some calories. So you'd want to give them some dextrose, and also check electrolytes. So the next one, you've been called to the Jerry's ward to prescribe some IV fluids for Phyllis. Um, she's been treated for hyperactive delirium, secondary to UTI and constipation and has also not been eating and drinking very much as a conscientious F1, you decide to check bloods first instead of just prescribing fluids. So I'm not going to insult your intelligence by asking you what is wrong here. So you can obviously see that the urea is slightly high and that the potassium is quite low. So urea is slightly high is most likely in this case due to dehydration and the potassium is very low, probably linked to her not eating very much. Sodium is borderline. So what is the best fluid therapy for Phyllis? had one answer. Okay. Any more for any more? Okay. So again, a bit of a split vote. So well done to those of you who are HC. So Phyllis isn't eating or drinking. She's hypoactive delirium, so she's probably not doing very much. Um, so I'm glad none of you put E. Well done. Um, so C and D, you, you can argue that, well, if she starts eating tomorrow, well, would you put 
would you do 20 millimoles, 20 millimoles? Um, I would go towards 2.4 is quite low. Um, so I would go for 40 and 40 and then a bag without any, because obviously you don't want to give more than 80. And you're also giving each bag over 10 hours, so it's not too fast. Um, so um, sometimes I go for 40 and then a 20 bag if they're eating a little bit. So it, like I said, it's not one size fits all. You've got to assess the situation yourself. But if these were the options, it's like single best answer. So I would go for C in this case, because 20 and 20, actually you're only giving 40 minimals. And if they're not eating, just we have a little bit, how can you give some extra? Yes. So, so if I put maybe 20, 20 and 20, so in D, like if, if each of the bags had potassium, then yes. But actually you're giving 40 over 10 hours to someone with a potassium of 2.4. If you were doing it for someone who wasn't eating and drinking, but their potassium was three and they couldn't take sand okay because they weren't eating and drinking, then yes, I would go for 20. But because 2.4 is quite low. So um, yes, we would have to be, uh, while we have to be careful, I would go in this case for 40 and 40. If I put 40 and 20, that would be the best option probably or 20 and 40. But I think 20 and 20, given the potassium is 2.4 and we're aiming for 3.5, I would say 40 and 40 is better. And we are giving, we're not giving any of them like, you know, as um, over, uh, we're giving both bags over 10 hours. So I think it's, it's okay. Okay. So usually aim for about 80 millimoles a day. I'm sure you came across this when you were revising for PSA. Um, considering orally or intravenously, and they'll usually uh, come pre-made with 20 millimoles or 40 millimoles. Sometimes bags don't come with 20 millimoles of KCL added to the um, bag. Is there a specific method to calculate? There isn't. It's clinical judgment, so it depends how well the patient is eating and drinking. So in this, these patients, if I don't know them, I tend to get a bit of history. And if the nurse isn't able to tell me much, I'll even go as far as going to see them. Because if the potassium is that low, you'll probably want to make sure that they're you know stable and they don't have, you probably want to do an ECG as well. Because um, I've seen potassiums of like 1.8 and you know that comes up in normal bloods. You really want to go assess that patient. You want to do an ECG. We're going to come on to some of the ECG things to look out for. So I think you would just, um, it's a case by case basis. Um, and you would probably, if it's below 2.5, you just want to make sure the patient is okay because um, it's um, it's enough to replace an IV, obviously. So you want to ideally look at the patient. So there isn't a there isn't a specific method. It um, and if you're sh unsure as as an F1, how much do I give? Run it by a reg, or or even an SHO. There'll be uh, who's more experienced. They'll be able to help you up. But always escalate if you're unsure how much to. Uh, give because usually in those cases if you've gone and assessed the patient you can then hand that over to the red and say do you how much fluid and how quickly do you think i should give it to them um obviously check the potassium really to make sure you're not either giving too much or you're not giving it and that you're giving enough so make sure it's not one of the two extremes if they have continuous diarrhea and vomiting because of a really bad bout of colitis or other um, gastroenteritis um, the potassium might be low for longer, so you might need to keep giving them slow bags to hydrate them. So usually 2.6 to 3.4, most trusts say you can replace orally with things like sand okay. If 2.5 or lower, replace IV. But remember, if it's an elderly patient who has, you know, a potassium of 2.9 or 3, it's, it's in the oral range, but they might not be eating. Sand okay also tastes horrible. I've been told I've never had it myself, but a lot of these electrolyte replacement supplements um, taste horrible. So a lot of them spit it out or they refuse to take it. And so in that case, as long as they have IV access, replacing it, IV is often more practical. So uh, these are the kinds of things that I can tell you about to add, you know, ad infinitum, but once you're on the ward, you'll realize what I'm talking about a lot more. So ECG changes in hypokalemia. So you'll see things like ST depression, U wave. So after the T wave, after ST, you'll have a little T wave and then you'll have pronounced U waves and you'll have peaked P waves. So let's have a look at an ECG. So this is obviously, these are exaggerated examples, but this will help you. Uh, can I annotate? Is that on the yeah, okay. So um, let me just, I'm just going to close the chat for a second. Okay. And then can I take? So um, these. 
are the U waves. And then let me see a good example of it. So this doesn't have so the U wave, and then obviously we can see ST depression. I'm I'm just arbitrarily picking leads. I mean, most of the leads you'll be able to see them. Um, so you've got ST depression and lead two here. So there's widespread ST depression, and you've got U waves here. You've got U waves here, and then normal QRS. Can are there good examples of peaked P waves? Not really on this example. Um, okay, so. And then, oh, right, oh, cool. give me one sec. Right, there we go. Right, so hyperkalemia, as I'm sure it's been drilled into, is a medical emergency. And this is one of, this is quite common for you to deal with as an F1, F2 throughout life. Hyperkalemia is um, rampant, sadly, and you have to be very vigilant about it. So once potassium comes out, so some la some laboratory is really good at telling you, oh, the sample is hemolyzed, so that's likely why the potassium has come back as high. Um, so in Leicester, um, they would come up with a high potassium, and a lot of the time it would be hemolyzed. In Kettering, what's quite good is that they they will actually put a comment as to whether or not the sample is hemolyzed, and usually if it's hemolyzed, they say you can't interpret it and you need to just repeat it. If it's not hemolyzed, they'll put a comment saying the potassium is high and the sample is not hemolyzed, you need to act on it. So um, you, um, perform an ECG and then you guys will probably already be aware of this. There will be a hyperkalemia protocol for every trial. So if you're in doubt, if you can't remember in the moment, the first time you deal with hyperkalemia, you'll think, huh. so you'll need to escalate to your reg anyway. It's a medical emergency, but you can give the treatment and then you can ask for the reg for what else needs to be done. But what you need to be able to do is give the calcium gluconate there is academic debate as to whether or not calcium gluconate needs to be given in a number of, so if the potassium is between 5.5 and 6, you can get away with not giving calcium gluconate or calcium chloride because it is unlikely to affect the membrane stability. Um, and the other school of thought is if there are no ECG changes consistent with hypoglycemia, which we'll look, on, look at in a minute, then you don't need to give calcium gluconate. Honestly, in the heat of it, if you've got a potassium of six without ECG changes, I would practically still give calcium gluconate. You're not going to cause harm. So I would give the calcium gluconate. I would give the 10 units of insulin, usually at rapid, in 50 mils of 50% dextrose. Now, 50% dextrose is quite viscous stuff. So the alternative in our trust at the moment, for example, is 125 mils of 20% dextrose, which is easier to put through a cannula. Um, and then we also give salbutamol nebulizers. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the repeat use and eases usually post treatment. So the always perform VBG and repeat use and eases. I guess more applicable to the hemolyzed samples. Um, but um, like I've said, results should not delay treatment. If the result comes back at six, and you don't know whether it's hemolyzed or not. Um, if it's 6.5, to be honest, it's unlikely to be hemolyzed. So that's what you've asked. So yes, I would absolutely give treatment. Um, I would do an ECG and prescribe the treatment. So um, that would be kind of what you do. If it comes back, so like I said, in Ketchum, we were quite lucky because they put a comment saying this sample is hemolyzed, this sample is not hemolyzed. And we, we, that makes it easier for us because if they say not hemolyzed and the potassium to come back at 6.1, we'll just give treatment. Uh, 6.5 is pretty high. I would just give treatment and um, I would repeat a VBG anyway at the same time because you can get an immediate um, answer on the gas as well. Uh, whereas, um, and you can send off another sample, but um, the main thing is give the treatment like you've said and then check the use and use post treatment, repeat the ECG. And if you've given two rounds of treatment for hyperkalemia, three rounds, they might need acute hemodialysis. So you need to speak to renal. Renal are notorious about taking patients for um, hyperkalemia because their their threshold for what refractory hyperkalemia is is quite different, and they might give you other hints like giving IV bicarb, although that takes a long time, and um, um, 
they might say if if the uh, potassium is coming down but not enough so let's say it goes from 6.4 to 6.1 to 5.9 but you know it's still high they might recommend things like calcium and rhizobium but those are all specialist input things so i wouldn't get too bogged down the immediate management of hypokalemia three things 10 mils 10 percent calcium gluconate over 10 minutes all the tens and then 10 units at rapid and 50 mils 50 percent dextrose over 10 minutes and then salbutamol and nebulizers Good. IV, yes, exactly. So IV bicarb can cause cerebral edema. So we should not be giving it routinely for hyperkalemia unless we're giving like 500 mils over six hours, sometimes even 12 hours in the elderly if they're hyperkalemic for sort of, if it's like a slower coming down of the hyperkalemia. And often with those patients, they'll have chronic kidney disease and things. So you need to be very careful with IV bicarb and things like fluid um, fluid retention as well because uh, bicarb is usually given a sodium bicarb and obviously with the high sodium content you're going to retain more fluid so you, you shouldn't give it in fluid overload but like I said by the time you're getting to IV bicarb you've already contacted your senior as well as renal so that is just a by the by you might come across it in management of difficult hyperkalemia if renal's not going to take them for filtration or dialysis so um, I don't get bogged down about that. This is about what you need to do it's in the emergency. So, um, okay. So, I quite liked this diagram because these, I'm sure, has been drilled into you. So, prolonged PR, eventual loss of P wave or flattening of P wave, tall tent of T waves, and broad QRS. These are the things to look out for. And this is kind of a nice way of saying as the amount of potassium goes up, what the ECG changes are. Um, I don't even think I need to annotate this. I'm pretty sure you can see the extremely tall tented T waves and broad QRSs here. Um, and also, uh, I mean, if you can see a P wave, congratulations. I mean, these P waves are pretty non-existent. So this is, I have seen similar ECGs to this. I never thought, I thought all oh, these ECG changes are, um, you know, they're, they're just things that we learn. But the first time I actually saw ECG changes, it was like the potassium of 7.2 or something. And, um, it was, it, it's something that I still remember. I don't know if I have a picture on my phone, but yeah, okay. So give the treatment in, in make sure a senior is aware that this patient has hyperkalemia because that patient needs to be on the radar because you need to, so hyperkalemia, as you guys all know, is um, can eventually lead to ventricular fibrillation, which can lead to cardiac arrest. That is a shockable rhythm, but the, from the senior point of view, they need to be aware of this patient because they need to know how old is this patient and what is their escalation plan? Are they fully sus? Are they not? That kind of thing, because it then puts them in a frame of mind, yes, this is an acutely unwell patient with hyperkalemia who is for full escalation. So this patient is at risk of having cardiopulmonary arrest. So they need to be aware of patients with hyperkalemia. At the start, if you don't know whether you need to tell them, with hyperkalemia, I still tell them, even though I treat it, I'm like, Look, I've, I've prescribed treatment and they're giving it now for hyperkalemia. I've done an ECG. Um, I can't really see any ECG changes, but I've given the treatment. They'll say, okay, that's fine. Thanks for letting me know. Make sure you do the follow-up using these in BVG in three to four hours. So just, just let a senior know. Um, this is just kind of putting it all together. So you've got hypokalemia along the top, um, and then we can see like the U wave kind of um, progressing as the potassium is going down and the ST depression you can sort of see from here as well. And then hyperkalemia, we see the opposite way. So we, we're getting broadening of the QRS, which you can hopefully appreciate as it's going up. And then um, and flattening of the P wave. So that, that, that's actually demonstrated quite nicely here. Whereas in hypokalemia, you've got the P wave being quite pronounced throughout. But yeah, have a look at those in your own time. So, which of the following is not used in the management of hyperkalemia? Yeah, I'll wait for a few more responses.
Okay, I think most people have answered, and absolutely it is. Yeah. Right. Uh, a case for your aster chasing bloods, no significant past medical history, and being treated for an NRTI. So, um, making note of those bloods, so the EGFR is 29.2, and the baseline for them is in the 70s. So, high urea, high creatinine, low EGFR, slightly low potassium. What is an appropriate fluid therapy for Harry? If I tell you that the blood pressure is normal, should probably put that in the question. Yeah, okay. Yep, so I should have probably put that they're hemodynamically stable at this point. So yeah, you want to basically, 52 year old with no comorbidities, you can afford to give them slightly faster rate of fluids. Um, e, if they were hemodynamically unstable, would be an option, absolutely. So you would give them a stat. Um, over 10 hours, I'd probably do six and eight or something like that, to be honest. But with AKI3s, AKI2s, um, we and they're young, they don't have heart failure and, and confusing comorbidities. We sort of, we're quite, um, we're quite militant with giving fluids usually, because if they do go on to develop pulmonary edema later because of fluid overload, there is a quick fix for that, and that is IV freezomide, but they're more likely to have worsening hypovolume if you don't give them enough fluid. So fluid balance is tricky. Um, so let's have a look. So acute kidney injury. So it's either an increase. So we can look at it in, um, if we think about it in terms of serum creatinine or urine output reducing. So um, serum creatinine of one and a half times above what it was. Okay. Um, okay. We'll come back to that. Um, we'll come back to the CKD in a second. Hold on to that thought. Urine output of less than uh, 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for more than six hours so and then this just looks at aki stage two stage uh, stage one stage two stage three and then you can look at it in terms of serum creatinine and in terms of urine output you guys can read the exact values in your own time um so even with heart failure don't be too overcautious so don't give them like just one 12 hourly bag and that's it because chances are if they're AKI and heart failure. So I need to read into this IVC collapsibility. I think essentially, depending on the IVC diameter, I think there is a connection with how much uh, cardiac congestion there is and therefore how, how slow you to give fluid. So I will, I will have a formalized answer for, I think it was Sidhu who asked this question. Um, so I will, um, I'll think of an answer for you, but essentially with heart failure, yes, I wouldn't give four, six and six, but I would give perhaps one eight hourly bag, one 10 hourly bag, and then one 12 hourly bag, or like at least one eight hourly bag, I would say. And I usually, for take care with CCF, I usually check with the reg what they're happy for. And that usually eight, 10, 12 is something that I've done commonly or 10, 10, 12. Um, and if they're hemodynamic compromised, I'd give them 250 bolus. And like I said, you'd aim for that mean arterial pressure of something like 65 to um, make sure they're not dipping their BP. So if it's AKI on CKD, uh, AKI in CCF with someone who's like got, say, um, an acute um, pneumonia, 
um, or an acute, yeah, you know, like a UTI, you obviously want to be mindful of their reduced ejection fraction, but you want to give them enough fluids to treat the infection part of it because they will be losing more fluids. So you need to still replace that, which is why having that idea of aiming for a mean arterial pressure is quite good. Um, if you're stuck, enlist help from the renal team. We often have to in AKI with CCF. Um, but the things that you basically need is you need the strict fluid input output because that is what's going to tell you. Because if they, with CCF, obviously you don't want to aim for a positive fluid balance of a liter because obviously they're going to go into overload. But at the same time, if they have, if they're septic, but they've got an AKI, you don't want to aim for a negative fluid balance either where they're, where they're peeing out loads more, but they don't, they don't have enough. So the average from experience over the last two years, what I've noticed is AKI and CCF, they tend to go for, um, they tend to go for about a positive balance of no more than about 200 mil. So that is quite a fine balance to achieve. Uh, which is where you need to keep an eye on the urine output to uh, increase or decrease fluids and consider speaking to renal, your seniors. Sometimes, I'm not going to go into this because like I said, this is like a chat in itself. You can give calculated frusamide fluid challenges. So sometimes if they're not peeing, but they're not becoming overloaded, they, they might still need a, a shot of frusamide to help them pee. But then you also maintain fluids. But that, you will not see that unless... A senior has had input. I do not want you guys to worry about that. That is not a common that they, I mean, AKI with CCF is relatively common, but I don't want you to have to worry about that fine balance. But like I said, rough rule of thumb, because these are all practical things. So there's not like set rules or anything. Some trusts are very good. They have a, like they have very good AKI guidelines and then they have all different fluid replacement strategies depending on that. I have not been fortunate to have that. So we've had to do it sort of playing by ear and continuously monitoring the urine output. So as long as there is a good fluid balance chart that has been filled in regularly by the lovely nurses, you will be fine. Rough rule of thumb, aim for about positive balance of no more than 200 mils. Um, so in the young patients, you can give, you know, it's one hourly, then four hourly, then six hourly. Um, and in sepsis as well, especially with hyperlactatemia, metabolic acidosis, those kinds of things, you would want to, want to give fluids fast. Um, AKI and CKD, renal advice may be needed. So I think Matt has commented on, does he have stage two CKD? I'm gonna come on to CKD in a second. Yeah, so although this patient would technically with a base size 70s have CKD too, what's not written on this table is actually CKD is not diagnosed until patients start having symptoms. So the most common symptom of chronic kidney disease is lethargy really. So until until they have symptoms and a formal diagnosis of CKD through that, they're not. So even if they're, if they're stage one and two without symptoms, it's not classed as chronic kidney disease. So that 52 year old for argument's sake didn't have any comorbidities and didn't have anything else other than this acute LRTI that we were treating him for. So we were gonna keep, uh, and I purposely pick 70s because I know that's stage two. From stage three onwards, even without symptoms, it is CKD3. So that's just a, um, that's just the point. Okay. So I've not put cases for these, but other things that you will have to think about um, are calcium, phosphate, and magnesium. So with calcium, um, things that go hand in hand with calcium are PTH, phosphate, and vitamin D. So with regards to hypocalcemia, so hypocalcemia is often due to vitamin D deficiency. So in kids, as you know, that's called rickets and in adults, it's osteomalacia. It's quite common, especially in um, non-Caucasian populations in this country. So I myself had a very, very low vitamin D level and had to be given a treatment dose vitamin D. I still take vitamin D. I didn't have to take calcium, thankfully. Um, so... Uh, you can give things like ADCAL or ADCAL D3 if the calcium is slightly low. If it is below 1.9 in most trusts, that is an indication to give IV. So most trusts should have a very clear calcium guidelines for both hypo, for mainly for hypocalcemia, because hypercalcemia, um, you might know that is most commonly actually due to hyperparathyroidism. So you want to check the uh, parathyroid. A note that should be made is 
you should take a sample for parathyroid at the time that the um, calcium is high because otherwise it becomes uninterpretable. So this is a bugbear of the endocrine departments at both Leicester and Kettering that I've worked at. They always say, make sure when a uh, person comes in with deranged calcium, you take PTH at that time. Um, so the mainstay of treatment for hypercalcemia is uh, fluids. And you may also have to give things like um, IV pemidronate. Um, so um, with hypercalcemia, malignancy, um, which um, I've seen quite a bit of, they, they usually give a lot of fluids. So they're quite aggressive with the fluids again there, a little bit like AKI to um, try and drive the calcium down. And then they give uh, bisphosphonates, but there are a lot of things to consider when giving IV bisphosphonate. So I'm not going to go into that, delve into that into too much detail, but um, usually if you're giving bisphosphonates, you would be running it by the endo team, but that is kind of your escalation. So you have IV fluids and then you do IV bisphosphonates. Um, okay, so phosphate goes hand in hand with calcium. So in chronic kidney disease, for example, you would expect probably a higher phosphate because um, the kidneys will excrete the phosphate. So if the kidneys aren't working properly, your phosphate will go up. So um, a lot of the time phosphate is low because patients aren't eating. Phosphate can also be low in uh, things such as tumor lysis syndrome, which is seen with um, certain types of cancer, um, such as certain um, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and things like that. So um, you just wanna, so phosphate, I would always check. So calcium and phosphate come under bone profile in a lot of trusts. So I would always check bone profile and magnesium for a lot of geriatric patients who've, so geriatric complaint, like presenting complaints will always be poor oral intake, off legs, that kind of thing. So um, I would always just check bone profile and magnesium in them because chances are I've not been eating properly in a while. And sometimes you can just supplement it orally and sometimes they need, um, sometimes they need, uh, IV supplementation. Just a couple of days ago on the ward, we had a lady with a CKD with a phosphate of 0.17. So there's not actually a, so that means their creatinine clearance is low and that means that uh, that affects how quickly you can give IV phosphate. So um, we had to work with the pharmacist um, in order to work out a regime that would work for that lady. So. Um, phosphate polyfuser is what we always used to use until this week when I found out that the manufacturer is having trouble circulating more phosphate polyfuser. So there is a new thing called sodium glycerophosphate. And um, so instead of giving 20 millimoles in 250 over 12 hours, we ended up having to do it over 24 hours for that lady. And it did work because the phosphate came up. So her phosphate was 0.17, so very low. And then it came up. Um, it, well, it didn't recover fully, but it came up to, I think, 0.56, at which point we could start giving it um, orally. Okay, magnesium. Um, so there will be different things available in different trusts for oral and IV magnesium. So I'm not going into it in too much detail. The other fun point, I, again, can't remember the exact like biochemical reason, but low magnesium will lead to low potassium. And also low magnesium means you can't interpret interpret a, a PTH level. So when you're checking calcium, check magnesium as well. And uh, magnesium is also loved by cardiology because, um, because it's to do with the action potential and how much potassium goes into the cells and so on. So um, if you guys have a cardio job, ask them why they love magnesium so much. The other point I wanted to make is replace like with like. So if they've lost blood, yes, you can you can buy time by giving them fluid challenges, but ultimately you need to replace the blood. So in most trusts, they'll have an MTP or a massive hemorrhage or transfusion protocol where you um, get O negative blood from blood bank and you obviously take bloods to cross match for further. And you may also need to liaise with hematology to give other blood products as well as packed red cells in the form of O negative blood. So, um, uh, so that's just that. So in polytrauma cases, not only will you need to be giving fluid challenges or fluid boluses, you will also be needing to replace like with like. If they've lost a load of blood, if there's blood all over the sheets and on the floor, no matter how much crystal you give, you're not going to replace the blood. Um, this you can look at in your own time. So this just kind of looks at um, the different, um, like different types of fluid 
and considerations and some of the side effects of them. So I think that's quite a good table to look at in your own time. Other things to that I'm not going to dwell on too much, it's already past eight. Uh, so examining volume status, so these are things that will become bread and butter as you see more and more patients and perform more and more A2E assessments. This is not an exhaustive list of things, but these are things that you want to look out for when examining volume status. So dry mucous membranes, we often put as clinically dry. Skin tag, so reduced skin tag is usually, you know, that's uh, low volume. Capillary refill, so prolonged capillary refill is um, low, um, uh, as in a reduced volume status. JVP going up is increased volume status. So um, crackles on auscultation of lungs, looking at things like pulmonary edema, ascites, uh, distended bladder, peripheral edema, sacral, so edema, pallor, so if they've been bleeding loads, they might look as white as a sheet. Uh, reduced urine output or increased urine output, both will affect volume, um, how much they're drinking, and also gastrointestinal losses from diarrhea and vomiting. Pediatric fluids is a whole other topic in itself. Um, this is a worked example. If you want to look at more examples, I would look at OSCE stop, um, which I think has some more worked examples. So um, if you do a pediatric job, this will be bread and butter because they're very methodical with their fluids. When they give it, they calculate each bag that they give. So, um, and then, um, so this is a worked example. I'm not gonna talk through it, but I've purposefully put in a worked example there so that you can read it in your own time and see that. The other area that's more specialist, which is not gonna really be relevant to you unless you work in emergency medicine or burns, um, is the, um, how you replace fluids and burns. So there is a Parkland formula. I don't know if you, you guys have probably heard about it. So uh, this is the formula for it. And then we're, um, we, there's a, like a rule of nines with adults usually. So um, the upper limbs and head constitute 9%. The chest, but as in the th thorax and torso, back and each leg is also uh, 18% and then 1% uh, for like the perineal area. And then like you can see it varies with the child and infant. So that's to help you calculate the percentage of the body surface area that has been burned. So if they have like extensive burns to their um, front head and one arm, that will be 18 plus nine plus nine, so 18 plus 18, 36. So you would do four times 36 times weight. And then it's that mills over 24 hours and then you give um, half of that in eight hours and then the remaining amount of volume over the next 16 hours. But like I said, you will not be dealing with part of formula or burns really unless you're doing emergency med or you're in burn in Chelsea and West, for example, in which case they will go through part of formula in a lot more detail anyway. So um, I think some of the questions were, one was about IVC collapsibility in heart failure, which honestly there's a lot of literature on and Essentially, the the jury's still out on whether or not IVC collapsibility and the IVC diameter is related to um, higher rates of congestion, higher mortality from uh, fluid overload in CCF. Um, from a practical point of view, all I would say is, yes, you obviously need to be careful about the rate. You can't just give four hours, four hours and six hours. But um, you would um, you would still want to give the fluid. And remember, the use and ease that you do reflect the renal function from about six hours before the sample is taken. So if you've not been giving them fluids and you suddenly start giving them fluids in the last hour before you take the use and ease, it's not going to necessarily be better. So you want to give them the bags of treatment, like the bags of fluids as treatment before you take the use and ease. Um, so I think the other question was, why can't you give albumin in severe anemia? Um, so I'm just trying to
like I said, I will look into that for a proper answer and then um, um, I'll look into the answer and then that's it. But anyway, thank you for listening. Sorry for those couple of questions which I um, don't have a formal answer for. But um, thank you very much for listening and taking out time from your Friday evening. Remember, with AKI, I mean, with um, fluids generally, don't be scared. You're going to have to do it all the time anyway. So I'm very sure you'll very quickly get over your fear of them. Um, every case is not the same, as you guys already know from your questioning. Like, you know that every case is not the same. Considerations, obviously, what is their past medical history? What is their... Um, um, and what's their volume status now? So they're the kind of things. And what are you treating? So is it AKI? Is it sepsis? Is it hydration? Is it nil by mouth? Perioperative period. So those are the things that um, when you do your surgical job, you'll become much more OK with fluids in the perioperative period. Um, when you do a Jerry's job or an acute medicine job, which is a lot of it is Jerry's because of the elderly population in this country, you will get more of the hang of prescribing fluids as top-up hydration, and when you're prescribing fluids um, with patients with CKD or CCF. And then if you work in gastro, you then do hepatorenal syndrome and patients with portal hypertension where you don't want to overdo fluids because that will lead to congestion, like similar to cardiac failure. So um, you learn a lot more about fluid status in the difference as you do the jobs. These, this is just like kind of a crash course. I could have gone through all the different scenarios, but honestly, that comes from practical experience. So um, I hope this has been useful and you'll get the slides and I'll add in a slide about sepsis six. And um, these are kind of the bread and butter of what you'll be doing. So I hope this has helped. Thank you very much.